This video is brought to you by Sporlin. Quality, integrity, and tradition. I'm in a service call that this, uh, this is like a hybrid cooler freezer, uh, was temping high. They got a delivery and they loaded it in, but then the fans never came back on. So we're just gonna kind of go through everything. When I walked in the door, it's running and their thermometer, whether or not it's accurate, is saying 25 degrees. And that's about correct, because I think they run it at about 20 degrees, 15 degrees, something like that. So, so visual inspection shows me that the evaporator is a little dirty. It's not horrendous, but it's got some lint on it. So I'm gonna give it a quick brush um, before I go up onto the roof. And I went ahead and put my smart probes in here on my, uh, get the superheat and everything. And then I'll take the high side probe and the air temp probe up to the roof. So I'm gonna brush this real quick. Just, it's not horrible. So I think I can just get it. Yeah, it's just coming right off. So I'll just give it a quick brush and then uh, we'll jump on the roof. As I was leaving the, uh, walk in I, it's satisfied I could hear it so I come up onto the roof um, I have a feeling what's gonna happen here is that the unit was in a defrost because they called me about an hour and a half ago and uh, it looks like it just came out of a defrost but on top of that the defrost is too long on this guy this is a hybrid walk-in cooler it's got a freezer coil Shouldn't be running a 45 minute defrost and I bet you anything there's something going on with the limit switches because it should terminate defrost too if it goes too long. But but anyways, we need to shorten that. There's no need for a 45 minute defrost off the bat. You only need a half hour defrost in our area. And uh, yeah, we'll just check everything else out. Um, condensers look really dirty. So we'll give these guys a clean too. All of their condensers look dirty, so. All right, so I got the disconnect switch shut off. I verified power. We're gonna give this guy a quick rinse from the front, try not to blow it in. It's kind of dirty. And then we'll give it a rinse as best as we can from the inside out too. I went ahead really quickly and uh, hosed off all their other equipment too. They had other condensers and stuff. I just gave them a quick hose, nothing thorough. And then we'll get it from the inside out, like I said. If I can, I don't, I don't think I can, so. We'll just have to give it a good one from here. Not without taking out the fan motor, so. Give this real quick. Just wanna be careful not to saturate the motors if you can. That way they don't short out everywhere. Looks like it's coming pretty clean. It was just surface stuff. It's the same on the ACs too. I'm gonna recommend that they have us come back and do a proper cleaning on the AC units, cause that one on the inner coil is really dirty. But uh, let's just get them by. See what we can do. All right, I'll uh, let this dry off for a sec, pat it down. Normally just kind of pat down most of the water and then we'll uh, start it up. All right, the fan motors look slow just because of the frame rate of the camera, they're working properly. So uh, one thing I will say is we are running a uh, lower than normal head pressure right now because our condenser is wet and our sight glass is flashing. This unit can, uh, uses condenser flooding. We have a head pressure control valve right there. The bypass pressure is 180 PSI. Um, sometimes it takes a minute for the condenser to fill up with liquid, but this one has been flashing for quite a bit of time. Now, normally I wouldn't say wet the condenser to check the charge, but in this situation I had to, and uh, we're definitely not low because we're running about 177 PSI. Um, so, we should have a clear sight glass right now. So I'm gonna let it run for a few more minutes, see if it continues to do that. That could be something too. Um, and we'll check everything else out. So we're just gonna let it run. All right, so we are still running with a flashing sight glass. And again, this is not a good way to do this, but what I did is I have a mister keeping my head pressure right below the bypass pressure of the head pressure control valve. It's not really good method to use that unless you are very careful about this because you the, the fear is that you can overcharge a system. You don't want to saturate the condenser to the point that it brings the, the condensing temp down way too low, lower than a point that it'll ever be and then potentially you could overcharge the system. So you don't want to do that unless you're very careful. So what I'm doing here is just using a mister to keep the condensing temp just below because I just wanted to know if it really was low on gas because sometimes it could just be flooding the condenser and it takes a few minutes for the sight glass to clear up. So in my situation, we can test it. 
my uh, discharge line is warm liquid drain is cold liquid line is warm so it's partially bypassing it's not fully bypassing just partially um, and keeping the condenser a little bit cool and we're still flashing so in this situation I'm not going to charge it with the water this is just helping me to verify whether or not it was low on charge this is a micro channel condenser um, basically if you talk to Heatcraft which is the manufacturer of this unit they do give you a calculation on how to figure out the flooded charge but when you call tech support it's 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 so confusing that tech support just literally tells you to put the maximum amount of refrigerant in the system uh this unit i don't know on other units i know the maximum charge this one i don't know so i'm gonna have to do some research um and then i'll probably end up just pumping the system down and uh filling up the receiver is what i'm probably gonna end up doing another thing i want to point out too Micro channels are a little bit different than standard tube and fin condensers. And if you actually saturate the entire condenser, you can drive the head pressure up on a micro channel. And I'm kind of showing you that a little bit right now. My head pressure went up about one PSI, but if I turn this hose and saturate the condenser, you're not gonna get as much of the evaporation effect as if you were um, just uh, misting it, you know, uh, lightly, basically. So. Let's see if I can drive this head pressure up to show you guys. So I'll put it on the shower mode. Gotta be careful because I don't want to short out a fan motor. Let's just get it wet. See if we can't drive this head pressure up. Notice how the head pressure went up to 180. 183, 184. That's because we're saturating the condenser to the point that it can't breathe anymore and we're actually driving the head pressure up. Now, as we pull the water off, the evaporation effect will start happening and you'll start seeing. But look at, at one point we drove the head pressure all the way up to 190. So it's very easy to saturate a micro channel because of the small little openings for the air to pass through. And in fact, in the summertime, if you guys have ever seen it on like a 410A condensing unit or um, uh, air conditioning unit, you can actually trip the high head pressure control by turning it on right after you cleaned it. So that's why they tell you to tap the condensers. So it's gonna take a few minutes for the evaporation effect to kick in, or I can just simply start tapping, getting the water out of it. It takes a very long time for the water to come out of a micro channel. Um, so what I can do is turn this back down to mist And then we can just lightly mist it and we'll start dropping the head pressure again. It's very interesting, the whole dynamics of a micro channel. And there we go. We're dropping the head pressure down 179.5. Again, it's, it's kind of a trip how it works. Just, just light mist, letting the evaporation effect hell or work a little bit better helps with the micro channel. So I'm not using this to charge. I was just using this to verify that once we started uh, cooling down the condenser that the sight glass would continue to flash because the unit was satisfying too soon. So I propped open the door and we're just letting it run with just slight mist going across the condenser, keeping us below. It's 179.2 and I can go down here and hot discharge line, cold liquid drain, warm coming out of the head pressure control valve. So we're feeding warm or hot vapor into the top of the receiver and the problem is is that we don't have a proper liquid seal and our sight glass is flashing we are also running rather high superheat and this is evaporator superheat so we're going to go ahead and you can see it's kind of frosting up coming out of the valve the coil is not frosted up though so we're going to go ahead and bring the superheat down by bringing the stem out of the valve down we're going to go with the uh, these are barely, barely any turns. So that's one full turn, and we're gonna see what that does and let it run for a little bit. It's coming down, you gotta give it some time. Uh, they've had some other people working here previous to me. This is a new customer to me. So uh, normally I'd say there's a problem, but I wouldn't be surprised if someone's been wrenching on this valve and didn't know what they were doing. So we're gonna go ahead and get it dialed in and then give it a shot and see if we have any other issues with it. So there is something wrong with the valve after all because uh, I just adjusted it a little bit more and the valve won't um, adjust. It's basically opened all the way. So 
there's a power head issue or a strainer that's plugged up, something like that. Probably a power head issue. Uh, with the tightness of this valve, I'm not gonna change just that power head. I'd change the whole valve. We'll make the recommendations. They're gonna be fine and operating. It made a difference. We're from 30 degrees super heat now down to 16, so it's better than it was. Ideally, we're looking for eight to 10 degrees on this unit, so suction pressure went up a little bit. That's good too, so it's better than it was, and we'll submit a quote to replace the expansion valve. And then when we do that, we'll uh, recover the charge and weigh it in properly. I went ahead and cleared the sight glass for now. What I did was, I went ahead and before I added any gas, I went ahead and pumped down this receiver and checked the refrigerant level while it was pumped down. The refrigerant level was half a receiver. What I did was I found the paperwork for this condensing unit from Heatcraft. And again, it's very confusing, but uh, if I'm reading it correctly, it says that the winter charge is half a pound which makes sense because I know in these micro channel units, they take ounces literally to be the winter charge. You gotta be careful about overcharging them. So I went ahead and added half a pound of refrigerant to this unit. Again, it's kind of a guess, okay? Because even when I talk to Heatcraft, they don't have a, a definite answer on how to figure out the winter charge. Typically, uh, in the multiple times I've called them, they always tell you just to put the maximum amount of refrigerant uh, in the unit that they list as their maximum charge for the unit and they tell you to call it good at that So I am gonna call them again and go through this and see if I can get someone that explains their winter charge a little bit better To me because it's not like the normal Sporlin 90-30-1 method because that's on a tube and fin condenser But this is a micro channel. Okay, so Again, my logic was I pumped down the receiver. I knew that it wasn't um, Or that the liquid level when it was pumped down was halfway you never wanna go over 80% charge, which would theoretically be three quarters of a receiver. So all that I did was added a half a pound. It's kind of a guess, okay? But I think that's gonna solve it. As usual, big picture diagnosis. Went downstairs, checked the evaporator superheat because I noticed my suction pressure was a little bit low on my gauges, according to what Measure Quick said my target should be. I'm looking for about a 10 degree evaporator TD and we were really low. So went downstairs, found that the expansion valve was frosting and the superheat was really high. Adjusted the expansion valve, got the superheat down to what, 16 degrees or something like that? But then the valve would not adjust anymore. I pulled the stem completely out. I mean, you know, as far out of the valve as I can and it, and it stopped. So there's something going on there. More than likely, it's gonna be a power head issue or something like that. This unit does have a MOP charge or a pressure limiting power head. Those can be a little confusing too, but anyways, I'm gonna submit a quote to go ahead and replace that expansion valve. Now, if it was an easier valve and there wasn't so much stuff in there, I would try just changing the power head. But in this situation, it's so tight in there, I'm just gonna change the valve. It's just gonna be easier. Um, but normal operating procedure would be to pull the strainer, pump the system down, pull the strainer, see if it's clean, and then change the power head. Usually that fixes the expansion valve problems because usually there's not much inside the valve that can fail. But in this situation, I'm probably gonna go ahead and replace the valve. When I do that, in my quote to change the valve, I'll recover all the refrigerant and then I'll find out the maximum charge and I'll make sure that I quote for the right amount of refrigerant. It's possible that this unit was never charged correctly who knows, okay? Or it could have a leak. I'll definitely look at the evaporator too, and we'll see it when we pull a vacuum and all that good stuff. Initially, I think my initial call on this unit, I think the original problem was that they had gotten a delivery this morning, and the manager noticed when they were done putting the delivery away that the condensed, that the evaporators didn't turn on. It was probably just in defrost because it had those 45 minute defrost. That's the other thing too I need to look at before I leave was why didn't it terminate? Because it should have terminated on temperature unless someone disconnected the termination down there, which is very common, especially on these hybrid walk-in coolers because they maintain about, the manager said 28 degrees in the box. So a lot of times the defrost termination switch is, um, the coil won't get warm enough basically to terminate defrost. So anyways, or, or uh, because they run the higher temps, I should say, the coil will terminate defrost every single time, so a lot of people don't hook up the terminations. Now there is, Heatcraft does offer a different termination switch than what comes with the coil if you're gonna be running one of these weird hybrid ones, okay? Or if you happen to throw electric heat on a medium temp coil, they have a special uh, termination switch. So we'll look into that. Um, that's where we're at pretty much. Real quick, I went to go set the time on the defrost clock and the thing barely even moves. It's all gummed up with sand, so. That could be part of the problem too, even though it had the right time on it. It's possible that there's something going on with that. So the gears are all gummed up with sand. So 
We'll put a new defrost clock in our quote too. Like you're gonna get a little bit of everything on this. All right, so we're back here today and we're gonna go ahead and uh, replace this expansion valve. And I noticed that, I don't know why I didn't notice this last time, but there's oil all right here. Very common for them to leak at the Schraders and I noticed the Schrader seemed really loose. And let's see, uh, it's picking it up all right there. So we're gonna go ahead and recover the charge and we'll replace that Schrader valve when we do so. We're gonna go ahead and recover the charge. We've got the tank open. I purged to the tank before we turned it on. Field piece machine on, everything's open. Scale zeroed out right here. So we're gonna go ahead and hit start. And open it up. We are getting ready to put this new valve in. We got it wrapped in some wet rag, just kind of fitting it, and then we're gonna braze it in real quick. So shouldn't be too difficult. So we've got the valve protected with wet rag. I've got someone here helping me today, so we're gonna be able to, it's gonna try to fall down when I try to do the top braze, so. And we've got nitrogen flowing through this system too. There we go, we're getting hot enough now. I'm always a little heavy on my solder. Kind of a blind weld, I'm assuming it took in the back. I'm gonna go ahead and do this one real quick. currently doing a nitrogen pressure test we went ahead because we saw that leak um, I went ahead and cut that valve out because it was actually leaking on the top I hate doing that because you lose the ability to change the compressor without recovering the charge but it was just you know I'd rather be taken care of so I actually went a little high on my pressures should be okay though usually don't want to go that high I guess the important thing is, is that the evaporator is not that high. But then again, there is a solenoid down there, so the evaporator should be equalizing out. I'm a little confused. It should be equalizing. That's weird. I'll have to ask. I have a guy downstairs, so maybe the magnet came off or something. Because the solenoid magnet should be letting the pressures equalize all the way through. We verified that the solenoid magnet's still on. That is really weird that my pressures are not equalizing out. Huh, I do not have a pressure limiting power head on the valve anymore, so it shouldn't have anything to do with that. What is going on here? That is really weird. It wasn't a true 300 PSI. I don't know what happened there. I must have shut it off soon or something. It got trapped because uh, I equalized the gauges out and it didn't take very long at all and it dropped down to 180. So yeah, that was weird. I don't know what happened, but anyways, so we're just gonna do a standing pressure test. I mean, theoretically, I can go ahead and hit the tightness test. I don't have the suction clamp on, but it's it's looking at the suction pressure and timing it, so we can see what it drops. But there's gonna be a bit of refrigerant in there too, so just because it's still in the oil. But all right, we're gonna do that, and then we'll get the vacuum running. I know I'm not giving it the full amount of time, but it actually started like at 0.5 from the beginning. I It really hasn't even dropped in six minutes. I'm not worried about it. We're gonna go ahead and dump this nitrogen and uh, get the vacuum rig going, get this thing evacuating. Okay, um, I'm pulling down with the vacuum with the True Blue hoses and the Field Piece vacuum pump. I really like them, they do really well. Uh, the Micron gauge is attached and I I'm pulling from both sides right now because I wanna get the system down in pressure. But just understand the location of the Micron gauge and the valve core removal tool being open, this is a lower reading than what's truly in the system. I would get a real reading if I valved off this VCRT, the vacuum core removal tool. If I valved it off, this would still be reading the system pressure and we would only be pulling from the low side so you would get a very true reading. But I'm trying to get this system down uh, in the low microns you know, as quick as possible. Uh, 
Once I get into the thousand range, I'll close the gas ballast. You can tell on the field piece pump by the red light. So I'll close the gas ballast. Uh, I have new oil in there because I actually just cleaned out my van and changed the oil last night. I went ahead and closed the gas ballast. I really like how the light disappears, let you know, so you don't forget. We're pulling down. Kind of sucks though because I've got a rainstorm coming and it's drizzling on me right now. That's how it works, so we'll see what we can get to. The field piece vacuum pump can handle water. Um, the only thing is, is that if it's a torrential downpour, the uh, I think it's through the the gas the exhaust you can get water into the oil so that's the only thing but they have a built-in I mean the water would have to get above this level to get in there so like I said if it's a torrential downpour it'll get in there just put something over it that's all I do but I don't expect like a crazy downpour right now cool thing that I do like about this though is they purposely put a uh, hose thread on there so you could actually hook up a uh, garden hose to this and if you're in a place where you don't want to be putting all the refrigerant vapor exhaust from the vacuum pump like a medical facility or something you could exhaust it out of the room or something like that so it's kind of a cool feature we are running um, we're still in a vacuum but I turned power on energize the solenoid we had a solenoid coil or solenoid magnet on there but now we got the actual valve Everything's put back together. We ended up changing the thermostat too because it was all rusted out. Uh, so we just got to wait for the evacuation to finish. Went ahead and mounted the sensing bulb on the back wall that we gets a true reading. So we're just waiting for it to evacuate. This evacuation is taking longer than I'd like. And this is one of the reasons why I'm not a fan of using nitrogen um, unless I absolutely have to. Now this situation, I wanted to do it because I was looking for a leak. Um, and I wanted to pressure test the system, but I haven't released the video yet, but I actually have a video where I proved that nitrogen can also get stuck in the oil. I know a lot of people say that it can't. Once I release the video, you guys will see that the test is pretty obvious that nitrogen can get stuck in the oil. So what's happening here though, notice that my micron levels are 12, 13. So what happens, I have refrigerant and nitrogen in this. I'm gonna shake it. Look at how it jumped. That's because we've got nitrogen and refrigerant vapor that's trapped in the oil and it's boiling out. Now, I've already energized the power so the crankcase heater is getting hot. But what you can also do very carefully, this one's a hermetic compressor so I can just heat underneath. There's no wires on the other side that are getting melted. And uh, you can watch, we'll start climbing once I start heating up the oil. We're at 1264, 1263, you give it a minute. 1265, 66. See, because I'm boiling the non condensables and the moisture out of the oil in the refrigerant. We're not going to obtain a perfect vacuum here because I'm also trying to beat this rain. But uh, had I not put nitrogen in it, I wouldn't be so worried because it's just, in my opinion, refrigerant vapor. Um, now, if my vacuum was stalling out, Again, I'm not a genius when it comes to evacuation, but logically, if my vacuum was stalling out and if I shook the compressor or I heated up the oil and it didn't raise the micron levels, then I would assume that maybe we have a refrigerant leak. But I, I don't think we have a refrigerant leak because we did a pressure test, it held. I, granted, I only did it for six minutes, but it held. And um, I went ahead and changed the oil and it started pulling down a little bit faster and whenever I shake the compressor it rises so that tells me that it's just things boiling out of the oil. To be honest and I've said this before you know pulling a perfect vacuum isn't always practical when you're dealing with refrigeration. I mean obviously you want to try to do it as best as possible but I've got a walk-in that's at 46 degrees right now and you know we so long as we don't have a leak, I'm gonna have to open this system up because I can't have health inspectors walk in and see their food. Now, granted, their food temp isn't at 46 yet because we just shut it off this morning, but the air temp in the box, so it's slowly absorbing into the food, you know? You can't always get a perfect vacuum, especially on refrigeration, especially on old systems, and absolutely if you have a pump down system. Now, this isn't a pump down, but everything leaks on these systems, you know? Um, that's why I'm, I, it sucks that I put nitrogen in this because now it's like how much of the stuff that's left in there is nitrogen and that's a non-condensable. 
you know if it's just moisture you know we could hope that the dryer pulls some of it out but and and theoretically you know you're not going to get all the moisture out of the oil if it is but so we're going to have to go ahead and let this guy go i'm doing a test right now it's it was down to about 1100 microns i'm isolating it and checking it but we're going to go ahead and uh, disconnect everything and get it back up and running because i got to get this customer operating you got to be practical the box has been running and it's pretty much down to temp and uh we just came in here and our superheat from the factory it was at about 16 degrees and we went ahead and wrenched on the valve and opened it up about a turn and a half and we're just going to let it stabilize out i'm probably not going to adjust it anymore but we got it down to nine degrees so we're just waiting for the box to come down to temp and uh, we also adjusted the thermostat colder we're looking for about 20 degrees box temp it's about 25 in here right now so all right that is where we're going to leave it or about eight degrees superheat and it's still kind of moving a little bit uh i'd say we open the valve about two and a quarter turns i think which normally you shouldn't have to adjust these valves but this is kind of like one of those hybrid boxes so i'm sure that has something to do with it normally a walk-in freezer is negative 10 and technically this is a freezer coil so it's just that weird thing but yeah i think we're going to call it good at that our expansion valves now um basically uh responding uh the frost pattern looks nice and even i'm happy with that we put a new thermostat in and it's cold in the box. So the last thing we're gonna do is watch it come down in temp. All right, this thing is actually satisfied now. Uh, I came up here though because I'm gonna wait for it to turn back on and then we're gonna do a final leak check just to be safe. And you can see that we actually filled up the receiver and we marked it with the date right there. So that way people know that the full charge is at the receiver level right there. And there you go. So we marked it with today's date. I got new caps. Uh, everything's you know we, we installed the filter dryer so it's visible from the front of the unit yeah everything's looking good so last thing we're going to do i got my leak detector up here as soon as this thing turns on we'll do a leak test on everything we'll go downstairs leak check the evap real quick just to be sure it actually had gone into defrost um i didn't mention either that i went ahead and replaced the defrost clock and uh took care of that too so shorten the defrost because this isn't a typical walk-in freezer i'm only going to do a 15 minute defrost about uh here, 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 and then in the middle of the night. We had a service call, you know, like I said in the beginning of the video on a walk-in cooler slash freezer. Uh, they run like 25 degree box temp inside there. Not working, and initially, you know, I really think that it was just the defrost clock, but looking at the big picture, I saw that the unit had a flashing sight glass, and then I went, I went ahead and put my gauges on it. I went ahead and checked evaporator superheat. We were running kind of low suction pressure, found that the superheat was extremely high, uh, got no response from, or not very much response from adjusting the valve. So uh, pretty good odds that um, there was a problem with that valve. Uh, my thoughts were that it was in the power head. Uh, I have the valve, I'll actually di dissect it. Maybe I'll show it on a live stream or something like that. And we'll take it apart and figure out exactly what happened to it. But. Um, went ahead and uh, quoted it. It took actually like, it took him like a month almost to approve that quote. So it, it seemed like silly how long it took, but anyways, finally got it approved and uh, went it back out and replaced it. Um, recovered the gas, found a leak at the discharge line service valve. You know, I showed in this too, um, the evacuations guys. I've said this before, but you know, sometimes it's just not practical and it's not feasible to get a perfect vacuum. You, you've got customers that want their equipment running and you know, bottom line, they want it working. They want it working as best as possible. And sometimes you got to do what you got to do, you know? So I couldn't obtain a perfect vacuum in that system. I tried my best, but you know, with the time constraints I had and the system being at 46 degrees and their food still in the box, like we had to get it running. So went ahead and started it up. Um, we'll monitor it. You know, if I notice any other issues, we may, you know, go back in there and uh, do a better evacuation, maybe pull the charge. I don't know. You know, it just depends. We'll have to see what happens. Maybe we just go back and change the liquid line filter dryer. But for that one, this is it. Everything was operating properly. I didn't see any signs of non-condensables. So if there was something in there, it was very minute. Um, you know, so you just sometimes you got to understand that you can't always, you know, pull this perfect vacuum or you can't always braze with nitrogen. We try as much as we can to follow proper refrigeration practices, but sometimes, you know, things just don't work out the way that you planned them and you got to do what you got to do. Right. Uh, 
Couple things. Number one, thank you so very much, guys. You guys are awesome for watching these videos. If you're watching this till the end, you're a true, true uh, viewer, I guess, or whatever, loyal viewer, whatever you want to call it. Uh, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to my new YouTube channel. Very soon, going to be posting some videos. I've just been banking a lot of footage and I need to edit it down. Uh, the new channel is going to be called HVACR Tools. There'll be a link in the show notes of this video. Also, I mentioned it in my last uh, video that we started a new Discord server. Uh, it's just a way for you guys to communicate with myself and a couple other creators, some of my friends that we've kind of built this Discord together. And uh, we go on there, you know, maybe once or twice a day for a little while and just kind of chat with people. You can at mention us and stuff like that if you have questions. We're, we're still kind of building it and learning how the whole Discord thing works. So feel free to check it out. Uh, there'll be a link in the show notes of this video too. And uh, also... If you haven't already gotten your tickets, I will be at the AHR conference in at the end of January, beginning of February. Um, I will be making appearances at the Sporlin booth. Um, I'm sure I'll be possibly stopping by the Field Piece booth. Um, I know that the event, the uh, Brian Orr's HVACR school um, symposium, I can't remember what it's called, but it's an educational training thing. I know that they're sold out, but I'll be at that too. Uh, that'll be at the same time as AHR. So uh, if you guys happen to be making it to HR, send me a message or direct message me, you know, while HR is going on and uh, I'll be putting stuff out on social media too, saying where I'm at, you know, if I'm doing like meetups or things like that, because I'll definitely be spending uh, time at the Sporlin booth. So maybe we can schedule something where people can come to the Sporlin booth and meet me there, whatever. If anybody wants to meet up with me, you know, um, grab a bite to eat or something like that, maybe we'll work something out. So message me all my social medias in the show notes of this video. Uh, and that's pretty much it guys. All right. I really appreciate it. And, um, we'll catch you guys on the next one. Okay.